So in this talk, I wish to briefly cover the sources of the climate emergency, which also contribute to social inequality and the wider ecological crisis. And secondly, I'll touch upon the role of young people today in shaping the kinds of policies that can limit the climate crisis while building a more fair society. So to begin, the sources of the climate emergency. We all know about the greenhouse effect. Uh, we learned about it in school. Um, and in fact, this isn't new information that's come out over the last few decades. Uh, John Tyndall, an Irish physicist, confirmed that carbon dioxide is a heat trapping gas all the way back in 1850, soon after the birth of the Industrial Revolution. So over a century later, the U.S. government was publicly informed by NASA scientists uh, who testified in the Senate in 1989 about the greenhouse effect causing rising global temperatures, uh, which was no longer a theory, but very clear, um, and that this resulted from burning massive and growing amounts of fossil fuels, including coal, oil, and gas. So the science is clear, the science has been clear. The emission of greenhouse gases needs to be reduced to almost zero by 2050. So very much in our lifetimes, hopefully. Um, and what does this mean? This means cutting non-essential production, luxury production, wasteful production, uh, and totally replacing all necessary production and distribution uh, systems with non-polluting systems and sources. So in other words, the reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which is of the UN, also clarify that all activities that involve burning fossil fuels or destroying, destroying key carbon sinks like forests need to be almost entirely halted. So even though the entire mainstream media was covering the story of global warming in the late 1980s, elected representatives in the USA, the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, opted to take too little action too late in making them complicit in the already high toll of extractive and polluting economic system on the lives of families and communities around the world. This is a system that young people uh, around the world today, backed by the scientific community, are saying must be entirely transformed to safeguard life on Earth as well as create a more equal society. And it's not just young uto utopian visionaries who are, who are just saying, we need to change everything. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a basis for that. And the basis is in the scientific literature where scientists themselves say, everything that's driving our economy, all of these fossil fuels and projects of deforestation and these sorts of activities, are responsible for the crises we're seeing today. So if we want to curb the warming, um, which has warmed to a, a, over one degree above the pre-industrial average so far, if we want to limit that to what scientists think is the livable temperature of 1.5 degrees, um, we need to cut all of almost all of our use of these fossil fuels uh, over the next few decades. and. Uh, in the next 10 years, we're expected to cut the emissions of, uh, of, by about 50%. So that's something the rich countries should do first because they've been the biggest polluters. I want to share a personal story now to just highlight the ways in which the economy is functioning and how it actually hurts ordinary people local communities, and the future of the planet as a whole. Climate emergency and the need for rich countries to cut their emissions in half by 2030, that energy conglomerate to this day continues to generate power from predominantly fossil fuels. So it's not lack of information. You know, of course, they are very much aware of what they're doing. And this is typical of companies making a lot of money by neglecting their duty of care to their workers ignoring their impacts on the health of the community's air and water, 
and without any regard for the long-term climate impacts. So in other words, the public relations gimmicks about corporate social responsibility, um, despite those gimmicks, the bottom line for all competitive companies and banks continues to be earning profits or returns, not putting people or the planet first. For instance, Scientists working for Shell and Exxon were actually on record in as early as 1977 for, uh, for being aware of the greenhouse effect and uh, the climate crisis that would emerge from their oil activities. Yet, instead of speaking out um, and taking action to curb the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation responsible for most of the emissions, these companies hid their findings, refusing to even acknowledge the climate crisis publicly. And they did that for years. They and other oil giants poured a lot of money into public relations campaigns, spreading climate misinformation and also lobbying politicians to ensure that any climate legislation would not hurt their bottom line, demanding uh, that, you know, that they make money regardless of the social and ecological costs. So all of these activities were actively supported by the US government, which from its very foundation privileges the interests of big money uh, over the lives and futures of ordinary people like you and me. And the United Nations has held climate summits every year for the last 26 years Yet none of the international agreements, including the Paris Accord, uh, which isn't even legally binding, have put us on track to rapidly phase out the extractive and polluting industries um, while replacing them with ecologically sustainable and humane alternatives. The fossil fuel industry playing an active role in the international climate summits has a lot to do with the failure of governments to act in the fair, amb ambitious, and bold way needed to address the climate crisis that is already producing terrifying impacts. All of these years of wasted time has yielded melting glaciers and increased landslides in places like Gilgit Baltistan, mega floods in many, uh, many places uh, across this country, even the most recent uh, floods in Sindh, for instance, heat waves, droughts, locust swarms destroying crops. The Arctic is literally thawing and burning this year, uh, while warming oceans swell and inundate coastlines and small islands. Um, the future of Karachi is looking rather bleak, um, such a massive city on the coastline. And so we know the future holds even more of these devastating outcomes and worse. But young people today, including yourselves, are refusing to accept a future of worsening conditions as inevitable. School strikers from the Fridays for Future movement and young activists organizing regular creative public actions for Green New Deal type policies show us that this generation refuses the collective amnesia and cognitive dissonance of our elders about what it will really take to uh, mitigate the warming uh, to a more liver livable temperature. So taking the science of the IPCC, chain, uh, IC, IPCC seriously, the reports from the IPCC, Young people are demonstrating that they are willing to create the groundswell of pressure from below to force our governments to act in defense of people and the planet. And what is even more remarkable than the readiness of this generation to organize, to plan for a better world, is the insistence on the centrality of, of the question of justice. Climate justice is both about understanding how poor marginalized communities bear the brunt of the climate impacts, uh, even though they're the least responsible for creating the crisis. Uh, it's also about understanding which countries, companies, and communities have benefited from generating this crisis and devising plans 
to stop them in their tracks and make the polluters pay for the necessary transition. Climate justice is about constructing sustainable alternatives through local and democratic decision making. So what I see today in an unraveling world is young people across continents who are fed up with the growing inequality, the lack of meaningful democracy, and the destruction of the world today. Our generation is the last generation that can take appropriate policy measures to meet um, the GHG reduction targets of cutting emissions in half by 2030 and almost entirely by 2050. Our task then is to transition the global economy to one that sustainably meets 21st century needs for all. Uh, using renewable energy resources like solar, wind, tidal and wave power, geothermal, also electrical transport and regenerative agriculture. Young people in the US are pushing for a Green New Deal that will create jobs to the millions of unemployed people, uh, especially people of color and women who've lost their jobs during the pandemic. And people's movements in other countries around the world are also advancing programs that can give job guarantees, doing the essential work, transitioning energy, transport, and food systems, as well as scaling up sustainable housing and developing quality water and electricity infrastructure. So the Progressive International, it's a growing international body of people who are planning to usher in what Naomi Klein calls the years of repair. And, um, you know, those years need to start from now. They should have, should have started 20 or 30 years ago. It hasn't started. Things are just getting worse in terms of the pollution uh, and assault on uh, the ecology around us, not to mention, uh, you know, the type of repair that's necessary in terms of our social systems.